Okay, well, we'll do our own introductions. How about that? And um, do you want to start? Sure. Again, I'm Philip. I'm president of the German Cycling Association, and I'm not in the shop. Here we go. Yeah, that's about it. And Philip is also uh, chairman of the advisory board of the ISA. Sure. And some other stuff, I'm sure. Uh, Thomas Bockingham, President of Swiss Slackline and Vice President of ISA. My name is Stefan, co-founder of Red Slackline. And Laurent Berthier, uh, fundator of Slack Enough Company and also uh, Slackline German Manufacturer Designer. Sonia Everson, uh, President of the International Slackline Association. And Slackline yours. Jerry Wyszewski, founder and CEO of Balance Community. Sam Mollery, co-founder of Slacktivity. Amy Lugnam, employee of Land Cruising Slacklands. Now begins our incredibly complex discussion about certifying Slackline gear. We have so many slides about this. We're sorry. Yeah, sorry. Oh, an accident closes. <laughs> <laughs> Sonia saved you all. Okay. Next slide. Ah, content. You want to show it all? You start it off. I start it off. Okay, so the idea of the quality or safety label, as we sort of name it right now, is that in other industries we have standards and norms um, that have been around for quite a while. And the problem with those standards is they're usually very rigid, they're very expensive to make, and very hard to change. And the Slagan community, as it is right now, is fairly poor, fairly small, and changing rapidly. So. If the ISA wanted to introduce a norm, that would be sort of putting a cage up on this development, or probably be misguided and outdated after a couple of years. As we've seen with Germany, as we have a small D norm for slackline systems, that's completely irrelevant to most of the slackline scene right now. It's like maybe irrelevant for schools, but outside of that, it just doesn't cover any sort of slack and stuff. So that's why we thought we're going to go more into the direction of creating a small quality label that can be adapted and changed rather easily without great costs. What is the function of a quality label? Um, what does it do? Just somebody shout out, what, what, what does a safety label do? It uh, differentiates uh, bad gear from good gear. <laughs> <laughs> differentiates gear between quality levels, bad quality, good quality. Yeah, well, yeah but it's it's not all the time. It not all states the time. minimum quality requirements. <laughs> minimum quality requirements. Chill. Yeah, I was thinking it's going to give the uh, uh, assurance that the product's actually been used and tested through this end. I mean, assurance that the gear's been tested appropriately, well, yeah. researched. Yeah. And makes it comparable? Comparable, yeah. Uh, you can compare the gear between different states. Yeah. Okay. Liability. Liability. Reliability, oh. <laughs> Reliability. Or liability. So, when you look at the UIAA, which might be our closest comparison for a, a gear quality label, when you look at what they've done for their certified gear, how does it function? What's, what, what, what do you, why do people choose UIAA gear? Well, probably for the same reasons you guys have just listed, quality, you can have a minimum standard, everybody can be assured. And comparability. 
So a lot of people think that it's a, a safety label, and in fact it is a safety label. It's a minimum safety label, uh, minimum safety standard for the climbing gear. But something else that we don't really think about when it comes to the UIA standard for, for climbing gear is that it's a very good means of protecting the slackline gear, or the climbing gear manufacturers. And when you think about that, you're like, you say, well, how does that protect them? It costs them $10,000 per test, or it costs them all this expense and research per test. It seems like it's a, a burden on these climbing gear manufacturers. And in a way, it is. It does hamper innovation, as Philip brought up. It does have the potential to uh, make it so small, innovative companies have a much more difficult time of getting into the field and, and really changing the game. And that's, that's difficult. But what it does do is also the exact same thing. It prevents a lot of the small or a lot of other manufacturers of climbing equipment who don't necessarily care about gear quality or gear standards or, or some level of gear safety. Uh, they don't necessarily care about testing their gear, breaking their gear, having three sigma uh, standards on their gear. Uh, they don't spend so much time on understanding materials and following the latest developments in, in climbing materials. People, you know, uh, companies who are making climbing gear that don't have the UIA label, the label helps people understand the companies that do follow these things. And that way, this label, this uh, UIA label, one of, the, one of the functions of it is protecting the climbing companies from the international manufacturers who can make gear really, really cheap. What was the last uh, non-certified rock climbing cam you saw? It's one out of Poland about 10 years ago that they're really trying to get certified, they're really trying to you know, get into the market. Uh, but they weren't certified, but they were still selling the gear. As far as I know, that company never made it. Um, and you know, maybe the uh, restrictions were a bit too tough for them, or maybe they couldn't meet the qualifications. But what we do know in there is that there's not 50 different manufacturers of climbing cams out there. There's not a whole bunch of different manufacturers who are just taking the cheapest, cheapest shortcut that they can and producing gear. So what happens with that, there's a lot of higher quality climbing gear out there. Uh, all of the cams that are on the market, almost all of them are really pretty quite high quality. And all of the carabiners that are on the market are quite high quality. Every now and then you hear of a recall, but that's something that the manufacturers are voluntarily stepping forward and doing. Then you see thousands and thousands and thousands of carabiners on Amazon. But those carabiners don't have that UIA label. And people who go out climbing are not going to use those carabiners that they find off of Amazon or AliExpress or whatever. They're not going to use these carabiners for their rock climbing because they, they don't know if it's been tested right. They don't know that it's a, a minimum quality. So most climbers in the whole world are not using this really low quality equipment. Most people that go out and climbing are not using this cheap, you know, um, international uh, kind of gear. And what does that do for rock climbing? And what does that do for rock climbing companies? Well, it helps drive the sales to rock climbing companies, the people who are actually doing the quality work, the people who are actually making a minimum standard. But it also, it also means that there's far fewer climbing deaths. There's far fewer climbing gear failures. Because this, just because of this quality label. Now imagine if there was not the UIA quality label, and it was a free-for-all. How would, the, how would Black Diamond certify that their carabiner is a better quality than, say, I don't know, some other cheap manufacturer? Uh, there, there are some European norms, um, okay. national norms, and European norms also. Here in Europe, I don't know in the US. It's even more than less. It's the same. Well, the, <laughs> the UIA norm, let's say for carabiners, it will, it's older and it was basically just taken over by the EM uh -huh. guys and they changed it a bit to make it um, even uh, a bit 
softer, so the UAA standards are actually higher. Yeah. Yeah. So th that's, that's something different. The UAA um, safety label is voluntary yeah. for a manufacturer, and the EN is not voluntary anymore. That's law. Yeah. Yeah. Something very different. So also, this is from Asia and some point too, where countries are going to get <laughs> Thomas says that it might happen in 20 or 30 years. But you're right. If we come forward with such a quality label and it's going to be accepted and implemented and most of the sign manufacturers take this and the community wants it on their equipment, if cycling ever grows so big, it will probably be adopted into a legitimate norm. But by then, we might have figured out how cycling works. So there won't be as many changes to what we do now. Something that is happening right now in slack planning, which is, uh, you guys are all aware of it, um, for me, it's a very scary trend, I think, which is the Amazon manufacturers, uh, or the manufacturers who sell, close, close the window. The manufacturers who are selling gear on Amazon that are not Slackline manufacturers. These are just white label retailers, people who can print their own things on the webbing and print their own boxes. They never even touch the slack line. These are people that sit in their homes and say, hey, I can make a margin on this ratchet kit. I don't care anything about the ratchet kit. I know nothing about slack lining, but I put a label on there that says slack line. I sell it for 20, 30 euro on, on Amazon. Don't care about the quality. Let's just get it out there. And that's undercutting all of the slack line manufacturers. And it's really hurting a lot of the slack line companies, the people who are actually putting the, the money and the research, the time, to do slack planning well. We can see, I don't know how Gibbon sales are doing, I don't know how slack line industry sales are doing, I don't wanna comment on that, but it's hurting. It's hurting the people who are actually caring about the, the sport. And uh, all the other good manufacturers of slack line gear out there are being hurt by these really low quality sales. Okay, so next up, what have we done so far? Um, basically, we've done two major projects in direction of the safety label. And the first one is a collaboration between two companies which aren't named or present or whatever. Um, <laughs> but we've been uh, privately, Bradley, I and these companies, have been working towards an idea of creating a standard for weblog testing or a weblog testing procedure so that all the weblogs can go through the same test and then, as Thomas said in his talk, get the same comparable numbers, have the same definitions of working load, have the same break tests and the same results in the break test. Because if you test weblogs differently, as you may have seen Stefan breaking his weblog only on the barrel and not as a weblog, um, you get different numbers. And if everyone just puts different numbers and no one knows how they're tested, there's no way that you as a consumer can know how strong your weblog actually is. And that one makes it a lot easier for the consumers to understand the material they, they buy, and two makes it a lot easier for the manufacturers to um, get away with, or to, to have a more accepted definition of working loss. So they're not the ones who have to stress too much about the um, how how high I go with this working load, how how strong does my weblog need to be? Because everyone is already on the same page. Okay. And then the we can ask questions about this more specifically later, I guess. Um, the second one that has been done so far is the German Association has put down basically the entire work behind such a quali uh, quality label. So we've put down uh, 10, 15 pages of description of what Slackline kits and Slackline equipment should be like if it's sold and be considered <coughs> of quality. And that includes how instructions should be, um, how the booklets have to be, how the use cases have to be, that includes how working load limit is defined, that includes that every beginner kit has to be sold with pre-protection and with manual and stuff like that. So all of this background work has already been done, although not decided and not published or anything. 
It's just like a big effort of just putting everything down and then later as a community we have to decide what is the level that we expect from equipment and then the manufacturers can say, okay, well, I can easily meet that. I want that label on my, on my stuff. And the community has to respond by either preferring that and then bringing the quality label into existence and into acceptance or say, well, I don't care that much and then it looks all for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, and the, the third thing we did is, um, maybe you've read it on the ISA webpage, we did a 3Pro consumer test, um, which is sort of like a feel out for how the community picks up the idea of the ISA commenting on safety, or well, with 3Pro it's not much safety, but the ISA commenting on the quality of, of different equipment, and I think it was sort of very well received, although not too publicly shared. Um, the 3Pro consumer test was done in the Youth in Action program last year, and what we did is we took almost all the tree pro there was, we invited all the second manufacturers to send us their tree pro, so that we could test it side by side and then rate it next to each other. Um, not only did we create a rating to say, okay, this tree pro is the best, this tree pro is the worst, but we also came up with like minimum standards that need to be met. And so we can communicate now to all the, com uh, all the manufacturers who have participated, okay, if you want your tree pro to be accepted, as good tree pro by the ISA, you have to have it so long, so high, so wide, and so durable. And we've only been able to um, to put numbers on these values because we've compared all the second trees, uh, all the tree protections, and then as a community of 30 experienced slackliners decided, okay, this is acceptable, and this is not acceptable, and this is probably the way to go forward, but for every certain piece of kit. So, what should be done? Um, the ISA, what can we do? We formed, actually, we had our first discussion three years ago, three and a half years ago, in Turkey. We got, uh, it was, uh, Thomas was there, Snoodle was there, Sonia was there, Piotr. I was there, Piotr was there, yeah. Who else was there? Harry. Harry was there. Okay, yeah. But this was a this was a Rito camp in Turkey um, uh, three and a half years ago where we were talking about national associations and international associations of what can be done and what's needed to be done in slacklining. Uh, and of course, the conversation came up about um, certified gear. And uh, Thomas brought up a really good point. Um, what is the purpose of certified gear? What, how can the ISA do that? And also gave a very strong reality check that uh, you can't just form the ISA and suddenly say this is a, uh, we've got a, a certified gear label, now do it. Um, it's a very long and very difficult process. The UIA took a long, long time doing theirs and um, so it's, it's not something that can be immediately uh, accomplished, but it's a long process and that's now, partially what we formed the Safety Commission for. In the Safety Commission Charter, it, sh it says that the, um, that, they that the Safety Commission will be uh, making a certified gear label. This was ratified by the General Assembly in the creation of the Safety Commission. So, what can be done? What should be done? What should be done for a certified gear label? Just any ideas out here? Cyclic loading measurements. Excellent. Uh, can we have somebody write this down? It's already happening. Oh, no, who's writing? Digital. Oh, who's digitally writing? Oh, thank you, Laura. Um, okay. Cyclic loading. What else? A working load limit for different fabrics and methods. Working load limit, as opposed to minimum breaking strength. If it was across the board, I think it would make a lot more sense with 
how working load limit is different in France, and they actually use that as a breaking strength. Um, that safe working load is, is confusing to people. I think if we if we put a stamp on slack line gear across the board, that gave people coming into the sport like, oh yeah, that's the load I don't go over, and this is why we have the safety factors. I think it would be educational as as well as useful. I think you, I think you have to standardise your own breaking strength before you do that. Yeah. Yeah. I think they go hand in hand, and to do just a working load limit without standardising minimum breaking strength, you can have different ones for different materials, but do one without the other really doesn't make sense. At least doing a working load limit without the minimum breaking strength really doesn't make sense. So what I'm hearing is working load limits, minimum breaking strength, safe working limits, safety factors, and how they relate to the materials we use. Abrasion resistance. Next one, abrasion resistance. Okay. Sharp edges. Sharp edges. I mean, sharp edges on gear. That's probably the easiest one we can ever <laughs> accomplish. That's the, probably the easiest we, uh, standard we could possibly make. Still? Maybe also the production circumstances. So, for example, that if it's produced in China, that it's known that it's produced under human rights or something like that. Okay, so ethical standards. Uh, ethical standards. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oliver, is this going too fast for you? No. No? Quick take. I just wanted I just wanted to add that if we're talking about the working load limit, we should also define what it is in slackline application. So is it our peak loads or our working tension or what is that? I, I had that in my presentation, but I think it somehow skipped. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. yeah. That's a very important point. We need to define what we understand as a working load limit. It's not, it's not clear. For the beginning, beginner kids, maybe we can think about something like, you know, idiot proof. You know, sometimes they, they yeah. cannot make yeah. any mistake, like fatal mistake, so it can be a part of the for the beginner kids. So, so very simple, idiot-proof beginner kids. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a very good one. Maybe also how many pieces of montage have to be tested so to say it gets reliable. Okay. So batch testing. Batch testing. testing. Standards for batch testing. Yeah. Two sigma. One sigma. Instructions for use. Yeah. Instructions for use. So what's included with the slackline gear that is appropriately uh, clarified how it's used and how it's not to be used? Uh, specifically on that topic, we have a lot of, at least for, for long trick and highlights, I think, um, we need to orientate ourselves, or orient ourselves um, for the instruction standards that PPE has, so personal protective equipment. Since it is life critical that my trick line doesn't fail, the instruction needs to include everything that's stated by the PPE standard that has to be included anyways. And I think um, if you follow this very closely, you already have a very, very good um, like first idea of what an instruction book is, needs to look like. So we can look at other industries and use a lot of their stuff to implement in ours. Like the UEA has been coming up over and over and over again. Their testing procedures can more or less be implemented for WebOps as well, to a certain degree. We've talked a lot about gear that we're all very familiar with, so and gear that we all use quite a bit. And this crowd, unfortunately, does not contain all that many trick liners. And ratchets are by a massive proportion, the number one device used uh, for new slackliners, um, aside from webbing. Uh, ratchets are the most widely known and used, and, and the, probably the way almost everybody thinks of slacklining. So web locks and shackles and all of these things, these are not necessarily gear that's right at the entry. Now, this is just my view, um, but if we have the majority, say 99% of all new slack lines, maybe 99.9% .9 of all new slack lines or kits produced in the world are with ratchet kits, meaning 99% of all the people that are being introduced to slack lines, and maybe a good proportion, say 60%, 50, 60%, maybe, 
are all white label, extremely low quality slackline kids. Should these kind of kits be something that the ISA focuses on even more? I just want to chime in on that and say that one of the things I didn't talk about in my SAIR conversation yesterday is that we've only had one death actually due to the act of slacklining, but there's been five other deaths related to slacklining, and two of those have to do with ratchet failure or ratchet kit failures, not the ratchet itself failing, but the growth hitch failing. Um, and there's and we also heard a mention earlier of someone who had a ratchet impaled in their back and had to have it surgically removed. We definitely see the most dramatic injuries and the most dramatic. Um, well, deaths, to be fair, uh, coming out of trick lining, and largely because in the early introduction of those ratchet kits going into, particularly in South America, there was no education about how to use them at the time. And we're getting better, but I just want to drive home that this is where we do really have the, the highest risk and the highest incidence of uh, injuries and incidents. And just to point out, those are the SAIRs that came in to our, through our reporting system. Uh, these, it's amazing that we can get any um, SARs from um, South America or some, from places where they don't know about the ISA that well. So just, there's, there's quite a lot more injuries out there that we don't know about. And so, this is my own question, my own personal question. Should something be done about, about entry kits, the very beginner level kits? <coughs> Further extending on from that, where introducing some sort of norm or some sort of standard for a kid, uh, could that have the potential to save some of the larger uh, slackline companies that are really putting in the work and effort? Um, given slackline industries, Elephant, which now has changed ownership, I guess, uh, some of the other really large slackline manufacturers, uh, maybe they do need a little bit of protection. Um, what would the slackline world be like if they fell and then the slackline quality for all the beginner kits was significantly lower because the, the quality manufacturers are not putting out the quality kits anymore? I think it is not only uh, something about the uh, like sustainability of the company, but also sustainability of the quality and the development of the sport. Mm -hmm. So we have this problem since there is like a, a lot of cheap uh, ratchet kits, which also accept I mean, uh, as well as being not safe, it is also not possible to uh, improve yourself on it. You cannot trick line on it. You cannot practice long lining. You cannot do, it's just something in between everything. So the people cannot just improve themselves. They cannot start high lining, long lining, or trick lining, whatever. So it's really important also for the development or future of the sport, I think. Um, on that note, I just want to add in that one of the things that's been in our benefit the past few years has been a stellar safety record. That when we do get kicked out of the park and they say, oh, you can't do that here because it's dangerous, we can actually cite data now that says, actually, no, it's not dangerous. That it's no more dangerous than playing Frisbee or whatever else anybody's doing in this park. But if the quality of the slack lines on the market going out to non-slack liners, going out to the general public, continues to decrease or is overwhelmed by low quality slack lines, <laughs> We're going to see more injuries. We're going to see more people afraid of slacklining because their kid got hurt by a bad kit, um, and that's going to make our like access for all of us more difficult. At all on such lines, but in the first place, that's what not not what they're meant for. Yeah. So maybe adding a back off is kind of you know work a workaround, whereas you could just say the ratchet shouldn't be as big. Yeah. Like I just put. Yeah, but I think it's definitely more difficult to define that mm -hmm. than to say, just have a backup. For right now, yes. Yeah, I, what you're talking about is a great long-term solution, potentially. Um, but we can potentially have backups as a minimum requirement tomorrow, if, you know, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, and it teaches a good ethic in people going to slack lines. When Sonia and I have uh, talked with um, slackline manufacturers as well from some of the larger manufacturers, one of the things that they've uh, explained is that it's pretty much impossible for them to include things like a backup or a span set or a tree pro in their kits because the white label manufacturers, the cheap, crappy manufacturers of slacklines, they don't include that. And so when they sell it to the big box stores, or the big retailers of 
for slackline kids, the big retailers are like, no, you need to make such a, you know, a small um, uh, margin on this because if you don't do it, then we'll get it from these other cheap people. Would it be possible that uh, that a certified gear uh, or a, a certified uh, quality label for slackline kits could be something that's a um, that encourages the big box stores to provide higher quality slacklines, requiring that they, you know, that they're not compelled; that it's compulsory, but it would still encourage people to be buying only the certified gear kits. Uh, one more thing to think about when talking with a lot of the climbing companies that I've gone out and I've spoken with uh, Petzl and Black Diamond and Edelrid and some of the other manufacturers. And one of the things that they've very, very, very clearly told us uh, is that they are not interested in slack climbing gear because there is no safety label. So will introducing a safety label in for slack climbing gear, will that diversify the ecosystem the Slackline ecosystem, and these companies, some of these very large companies, have a really enormous reach around the world. So if, say, Black Diamond or Petzl starts really producing, really, really producing Slackline gear, they already experiment with some small things, but they have the ability to reach Slackline gear all around the world. And if they're saying they're not gonna do it, until there's a safety label, I'm not saying they will do it if there's a safety label, but they wouldn't do it without a safety label. Is that something that um, that looks attractive to Slackline? Reaching out high quality gear from high quality manufacturers and diversifying the Slackline gear ecosystem. And I just want to put a note on that because we're sitting here with some Slackline gear manufacturers. We're not, not necessarily saying that Black Diamond would overrun the market, it would but potentially be partnerships but with existing companies. Um, which they already do. Some which some of them are already doing. And I just want to throw that out there that we're not talking about getting rid of you guys. We love you guys. <laughs> um, but that is a fact that if we have, you know, the safety label for the kits would be a little bit different here. But if we're talking about developing our own certifications and standards for producing a web block, for example, as soon as that existed, the benefit for us would be that we could have a lot more um, security in what we're doing. Getting insurance for events would be easier. Organizing events would be easier. Selling your products in REI, for example, or maybe you know, Decathlon, major stores, would be easier. And that would really help for the grassroots level. But that is also a factor that Black Diamond and Petzl and some of these other companies may also want to get involved at that point. And whether they design their own gear or whether they you know, buy your companies or License your products is another thing. Million dollar uh, buyout. So just throwing that out there. That is a factor in this discussion from a financial aspect. And also from the like the customer aspect, mm -hmm. it shouldn't be like just because it is certified, like I shouldn't pay fifty euros more for the same year that mm -hmm. already said without the certification. So this is also yeah. an important point. So now we'd like to open it up to if the gear manufacturers would like to say anything, and also questions and answers from the gear manufacturers and how they think about these things. Volunteers? Sam. All in all, I think it's a great idea to go in this direction. And as you've mentioned, I think like concentrating on Highline gear is much too early. It's also much too small. But like really the beginner market is where really those problems are much bigger, like in numbers especially. And I think we, we should start at the beginner market because like certifying a handful of weblogs, I don't see a point right now because it's like the, the money it takes to, to certify like this super specialized gear would be much bigger than the than the effect. But Certifying the beginner gear where the quantities are really big, especially with those rather shitty brands. Uh, I think there is is the real benefit for the community, and it would probably also make the, the sport grow all in all. So I think we as manufacturer would take profit of the of the whole thing. I think a, a good way to break the, the barrier for getting these certified beginner kits into large markets like REI and other big retailers is to provide the, the risk assessment side of like 
providing a backup with these kits. We have statistics that show that without a backup, there's a much higher risk for someone getting injured. Mm -hmm. And now we have these certified products that we can offer to you for slightly more money, but it reduces the risk of the product, which in the retailer's eyes, they have to get insurance, mm -hmm. and that gets reevaluated pretty often, and it could actually be cheaper for them to buy the more expensive gear. <coughs> That's a really good point you just made too about um, the risk to the to the retailer is that in situations where gear has been not in stock hunting so much but in climbing for example where gear has been misused or the manufacturer made a mistake the retailer has often been sued as well um, and that that's a real factor that you know you can you can't pitch that to a retailer this is safer for you to sell. This is not a problem for you. Uh, yes, it is actually European. But not, it's their like caps to what you can be sued to. It's not like you normally, if you have insurance as a company against like law, that you will totally be taken care of. Yeah. One of the cases that I'm thinking of was uh, the 12 year old climber that died in Italy, I believe. Or he was, he was French and died in Italy, or the other way around. But um, the manufacturer and the retailer were both sued in that case. There might be financial yeah, caps, sure. but it's, they, were, they were actually also being charged with manslaughter. At that point. <coughs> I don't know what the outcome of, the, of that was at this point, but that I has been a case. I don't know the outcome, but for the retailer, it's not so huge drawback. He hasn't like, the obligation to test the equipment. But he was charged with involuntary manslaughter. And that charge, I don't think, stuck. But what does that do to his company in the meantime? <laughs> okay. For myself, I think it's a really good idea to have a standard like that. I'm, I will not be as much enjoyed about the norm, a standard, but set, uh, the label is really great, maybe. Uh, you know, it will be um, one more challenge for us as manufacturers. Um, it will be at least uh, big benefits for the, our customers, and I hope it will be better for us, but we'll so <laughs> we will see, I, I really hope so. Yeah, I, also, I also think it's not about norming here, but about norming um, the tests. So that we have certain standards for testing here that have to be set, that every producer has to set to and Yeah, I like the concept in general, also especially for the beginner kits, to, to make them safer, but also for high-end gear. Yeah, I think it's cool to get in this direction and to um, make it easier for the consumer to understand how strong this, this piece of gear really is, what's our limits. Um, keep this, keeping this up with a uh, question now, um, if we can get more questions from the audience about directly to the manufacturers, that'd be great. My question to the manufacturers is, how do you guys see you can go about making an agreement? Or how would you guys see um, we could all come together and find some way to make a quality label, for example? I think it starts with transparency from a testing standpoint from all of our gear. How we, what tests we do, what, where we tested it, and the full method uh, or sample size, the whole methodology of, of the testing that we do. A uh, specific question on that, but you will probably not um, want this to be available to everyone, right? This whole documentation process. So, so <laughs> how would this work? Do you have an idea? Well, I mean, if there's, if there's intellectual property involved with the testing, then Sure, you don't want to share that with your competitors, but yeah. from like, for instance, webbing, yeah. how do we test the strength of it? Like at what speed, yeah. what's our clamping method at the end? Like this is, this is all standard stuff. And if it's, um, if it's shared amongst the, the manufacturers, we can come to agreements on what the parameters should be for that specific testing. Okay, so it, would it also be an option that like more sensitive information, which we, we could ask for, could then also be only be shared with us. <laughs> is that also an option? Would we see a problem with that, or 
do you think everything that is shared should actually be shareable to everyone? Yeah, I mean, for me myself, like if I, it'd be hard to share sensitive information about the testing of a new product that I'm working on if it's not yet protected intellectually, patent-wise, or whatever. Um, but for products that are readily available and that we're all selling, such as webbing or web blocks, mm -hmm. the, the way in which we test those objects and the data we get from those tests, that's what I'm specifically referencing. Not new products that maybe only I sell or maybe one or two of us sell. I was just thinking about this issue. Sorry. Yeah. I was just thinking about maybe you can, for example, create a, like a only one web block, banana, whatever, the bomber one, so all of the webbings can be tested on, on this or this kind of stuff. So you can maybe just create the standards for, for like testing instead of sending the good product. So you can obtain this standards and like me. Most webbing manufacturers have a, a standardized split jaw testing device. If they're, if they're producing anything for the industrial sector or automobiles, they have to test it with this specific size device. Yeah, but for, for the, for the twin, like wind webbing, we also... But it's a, it's a really yeah. wide split jaw device that works with any width or up to okay. huge widths. The question is, do the manufacturers test the gear themselves to get the label or do they send a sample to the ISA Safety Commission and they give it to a laboratory and there it will be tested? I think the second way is the more re reliable way and the way it should be done. So in the end, it's up to the Safety Commission how they want to test those to get the label for that. Or um, how the UAA does it, which is certified uh, testing institutions, a third party, that then costs quite a bit of money. <laughs> I would also say uh, I would pick the first way because uh, if we send gear to any certified uh, institute, it's so expensive and um, maybe the better way would be, like Jerry said, uh, to bring tr transparency into the process. Maybe uh, videotape the tests and publish the videos afterwards. I also think here we have to be careful to defer between tests of single pieces or entire slackline sets because like, for, let's take the example of tree protection. So if you just individually test tree protection, so one tree protection is maybe not great when used with span sets. On the other hand, with adjustable tree slings, it is good. And that, that's just one of really a lot of examples, like um, sets are designed to be used together and not as single pieces sometimes. Sometimes single pieces are designed to be used in uh, gear with other brands and so on. But like, especially with beginner kits, we also really have to see that we test the, the entire set. And now just see the discussion going to the point that um, it's the discussion like how to test just webbing. Mm -hmm. But I really see a, a more important thing like to, to test the entire beginner set and not just ready. And just make to clear that up a bit, I think it, the point is very uh, important. Uh, I think what you have to differentiate is the, the beginner sets, which should be tested, as you say correctly, as a set. And then when we're talking about um, webbings and weblogs, that's really a separate thing. So we're talking probably, most of us are thinking of one inch webbing first place, so it's really then long and high line here, so that's really a separate uh, project actually, uh, two, si two different things. And the top line, would top lining have to be different that size? It would probably Most likely be a set. Yeah, be a set. I know. Uh, yeah, my question to the manufacturers is, um, on the short term, so you, you're telling us that uh, by sharing your data about the, the tests and how you, um, how you make the tests, you would uh, probably come to an agreement. Uh, but here you only are five. I mean, there are lots more manufacturers. How do we make sure 
that this uh, first proposition is accepted by all. So we've tried this with the German companies, and uh, I think we have six or seven right now, like active companies in Germany. And um, we tried to invite everyone to a Hangouts meeting, like a Skype conference call, and just, just talk about the idea, pretty much like we're doing here, but in a more private circle. And um, it's very, it's going to be very, very difficult if you want everyone on the same page right at the beginning. There's definitely a couple of companies that will just be not interested or don't see a benefit in this. And they may, may not even have the time to just work with this because they're doing other things as well. Right? Not everyone is doing this like full time. There's a lot of people who just do it by the sides. And then there's a lot of companies that are basically run inside of bigger companies themselves. So they don't have the, the autonomy to decide for themselves to do this or not. And um, even if we don't have everyone at the same page right now, since it isn't a standard but a quality label, we can later also adapt it and just wait for their input to change. And then maybe they come in. And the reality is maybe some they all just never want to. And it's the same with the, the D norm we have in Germany right now. Most of the companies don't care about this because it's not really, um, it doesn't reflect what they're selling or it doesn't uh, encompass their, their product. Um, but the, the standard still exists. So it will always be, be some work to do. It'll never be like, okay, we're done. Everyone's on the same page. Everyone is happy. It will always be a project. And even if we don't get everyone at the same time, we can just work towards it. And as long as it's sort of a democratic process, I think mm -hmm. it's fine. I think the last thing you said is key, is that as long as it can be seen and is a democratic process, like it's not just Jerry defining a norm, for example, that fits his product better than everybody else's, which we know he wouldn't do that. But <laughs> as long as we have multiple companies, and particularly companies who maybe even see each other as competitors working together, then I think that's how we end up with an honest norm and people will come around to that. Maybe just to give a perspective of how the UAA, UIAA does this. Um, for those who don't know, this is the International Mountaineering Federation where all the national federations are a member. So similar to ISA in this perspective. And the way they did it, and that's basically what we adopted so far, is they created a UAA safety commission and the board of this commission is, um, consists mostly of representatives of national federations. There's also some gear manufacturers within that board, but they're not the president, not the vice president, and not the treasurer. And then uh, they basically have all the climbing companies as external partners of the UIAA. So we could adapt this for the ISA, so having Climbing, uh, having slackline manufacturers as external partners, and they will have a seat within the safety commission. They can, it's, it's like its own association, right? They're like a member of it. They sit in, they contribute, and you create working groups, one on web logs, one on webbing, one on beginner kits, with the manufacturers and the representatives from the National Federation. And then this, this is the way you, you start. So we're like kind of basically starting a cluster or like so it's it's really now uh, is it something that we want all together to work in one direction? That that's my question. Because it's known that for industries even rivals working together is always a benefit. It increases competition, it increases innovations, it it's proven already and so I'm really asking the questions. If you guys are ready for that, or if you are reading for that, is it in your the head, back of your head? I mean, it doesn't have to be now because it's still small and whatever. But if you want to reach maybe that um, beginner community and those beginner uh, uh, ratchet manufacturer and whatever, uh, starting as also providing information on the industry and maybe also like a whole sort of. Uh, 
creating a synergy could help closing the meeting. I just want to repeat the question so that the recording can catch it. The gist of it was, are we at a place as a community and as manufacturers where we're willing and ready to start doing this kind of thing? <laughs> Show of hands. Show of hands. Are we ready? Are we willing? <laughs> Not very enthusiastic. socially coerced. I mean, we're going to look at you really strong. <laughs> not really fair, not a very democratic way to do it. <laughs> so, um, there's, there's a, still a big question of what should be done, what's the first thing to be done, and who has the manpower to do that. And we're just volunteers. We're all volunteers, and we are putting in a lot of a lot of time of our own to make the ISA happen. And we're very grateful for all of you guys for all of your support to making the safety event happen. Um, this all right now is uh, being funded by our energy, by all of your energy. And how do we get it done from here? The ISA specifically made the safety commission. We adopted the Safety Commission, or the General Assembly has adopted the Safety Commission into the ISA to accomplish these things. But the Safety Commission is very small and it's still uh, only volunteer run. So, where do we go from here? And that leads us into our next discussion, um, which is the purpose and the future of the ISA Safety Commission. I'll take it. Should I request Harry? Uh, thank you to the gear manufacturers. Thank you guys very much for your work.